Good evening, everyone. Happy Friday. <laughs> we are uh, going to try something new tonight. The program is going to begin in uh, a little bit. Let's see, about uh, 12 minutes. But first, you have to uh, deal with me and have a little adventure along the ride. So if you're familiar with our morning newsletter, which you all should be subscribing to, uh, you're probably also familiar with the Boston News Quiz. And so we thought we'd have a little fun and play the Boston News Quiz before we uh, meet Douglas today. So let me power this up. And uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> we have prizes, so <laughs> who, who doesn't want swag? OK, I'm going to get this started. Um, grab your phones. Uh, go to Slido, it's S-L-I dot D-O, and type in Stuart. And you'll get to here, or you can scan the QR code and play along with me. Everyone, everyone ready? Shall we get going? OK, I'm going to fire this up. So you're going to have about 20 seconds to answer each question. And, uh, and when you log in, make sure you have your name and an initial, because there might be many Johns. There might be many. So I need to know who's going to win, who's going to get this t-shirt. OK, you guys ready? The t-shirt is, I'll show you. It's a WBUR t-shirt. We're going to have a model. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You see, now, now you know why this is going to be good. Okay. You guys ready for the first uh, question? Starting quiz now. Okay, you have 20 seconds. First one in gets the points for it. A recent report shows that Boston area blank are the sixth highest in the country behind only Miami, San Jose, San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. There we go. Okay. Next question. Let's see if I can fire this. Here we go. There we go. OK, next question. According to the Massachusetts State Auditor, the blank required for elections this year will cost the state more than $2 million. Everyone getting their answers in? Oh boy, hang on. This is our first time. Bear with us. Okay. There we go. Okay. Are you able to? There we go. This is working now. All the kinks worked live on stage. You see? That's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> Two, one, okay. And finally, there we go. Last but not least. Okay, last question. Which Boston building opened its doors to the public? this past week after being closed for nearly two years. Remember, a t-shirt is on the line here, people. <laughs> Five seconds. Hey, we only have one t-shirt. <laughs> we can share it. OK, there should be a winner. Somebody should have a prize, a trophy on their screen. All right, Daniela. Where is it? Who is it? Is it? Oh, it's you. Great. <laughs> Congratulations. You have to vary sizes. Can you do this next time? Yeah, it can be the tenth, but let me go and sizes. Thank you all for playing. Um, and if you want to receive this uh, every week, head over to wbur.org slash quiz. Um, and if you want to scan that QR code, you can receive uh, text alerts when the quiz is live. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. We'll have Douglas Stewart up in just a little bit. That was fun. Thank you. <laughs>
Applaud. <laughs> Emma Curry, you there? Good evening. Welcome to our in-person and virtual audience. My name's Amy McDonald. I'm the director of this joint. Um, I know that many of you were blown away by Douglas Stewart's debut novel, Shuggy Bane. <laughs> 
which won the Man Booker Prize, was a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, was a notable book for the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, best book of the year for LA Times, NPR, BuzzFeed, Economist, you get the picture. Uh, Douglas is back with his second novel, Young Mungo, and he'll be signing books. Did I pronounce it right, Mungo? And he'll be, he'll be signing books, our wonderful independent bookstore from Cambridge, Porter Square Books, is out in the lobby, and uh, Douglas will be signing books after his conversation with Emiko Tamagawa. Emiko, whenever I need a literary interviewer, I think of Emiko. She is a senior producer at Here and Now. She does many of the arts and culture pieces. She's a voracious reader. She's so smart. And um, she's going to, I'm just so looking forward to this conversation. Emiko and Douglas. Actually, you know, hearing all those awards, um, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, how do you write a second novel? But I have to say, I did hear that you did write M Young Mungo before all the hoopla about Chuggy Bain. Yes, and, and thank God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all for coming tonight. But yeah, I, I began to write Young Mungo in 2016, and I actually didn't try to publish Chuggy Bain until 2018, because I'd been writing for a really long time, but I hadn't... Uh, ever thought that I would ever be a published writer. I was working in textiles and design, and writing was my passion. It was my, my private space. And so I didn't know that I would ever be a published author, and I finished Shaggy Bay, and I started Young Mungo. And it was only when I started to almost complete Young Mungo that I thought, let's see if I can, if I can publish Shuggy. And I'm so glad that actually I'd finished my second novel before winning the Booker, because every journalist I talk to says, so you're going to have a really difficult second album. And it does nothing for your confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the thing is, um, and I, I know that a number of people have not, basically, I, it, it just came out Tuesday. It is so worth the read, um, but it will devastate you. I just want to say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you're there, welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there are a lot of similar themes. Um, this, you know, at the center, of young Mungo is Mungo, um, a, a young boy who is gay, um, who has a mother who is troubled, mm -hmm. um, and who loves her immeasurably. Um, and there is some something of that. Um, there's something about, and we will start as simply with his name. I mean, he is named for the patron saint of Glasgow, um, and that, that's very significant, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mungo is an incredibly gentle soul. He's a he's a fifteen year old uh, boy, which I would say when you're working class, that makes you almost a man. Um, but he's he's a very gentle, kind soul, and and he's named after the patron saint of Glasgow because he's he's seen as a symbol of peace within his family. He's trying to heal some pain for his mother and his father and and for his siblings, and and his gentleness is just innate in the way that the patron saint was. Uh, St. Mungo was very beloved in Glasgow. He founded the city with four very innocent, almost childlike miracles. He brought a bird back to life, a little robin. He found a ring that was missing. He made a bell ring that didn't have a clapper. They're very kind, almost childlike miracles. And Mungo has that quality to him. You know, he's, he's, he has no hidden agenda. He's a, he's a very nice kid. But right from the very beginning, mm -hmm. we start to worry about him. Mm -hmm. Because, and I will, you know, you, you hear this right at the beginning, he is going off on a fishing trip with two men he doesn't know very well. So you have, uh, you have this situation, but then you also have this other situation of sort of what led up to him becoming this, this boy who has to go on this fishing trip with two men he barely knows. And so why did you want to have those two sort of intertwining storylines, two timelines at the same time? Yeah, over the 10 years it took me to write Shuggy Bain, I was so consumed by the scale of that book. And just, I mean, the first draft of it was 1,800 pages, I should say. And, it, you know, I, I don't have an MFA. I didn't have a circle of writer friends. And so I write these 1,800 pages, and they're, they're housed in these two huge legal binders. And I turn to my, my poor husband, and I say, would you read it? And he says, <laughs> and I mean, what else could he say but yes, right? And so he says yes. 
and I give them, I think, four hours, and then I go, <laughs> are you finished? And, <laughs> and, and, you know, my husband did a really great job with Shuggy. He, he goes through the first 200 pages, and he's really thoughtful with his feedback. He's thinking about the characters and my use of language. And then round about page 200, like, the, the will to live just leaves his body. You can, you can tell it. And he starts just redacting the manuscript. He just takes a black pen, and he says, no, or ugh. <laughs> Or he says, stop it. And I only knew I was doing something right because I got three exclamation points and he didn't say what it was. But anyway, Shuggy was huge. And so when I came to Young Mungo, I knew I wanted to write something that was very plot driven, very propulsive, that had a sense of um, dread, had a sense of suspense to it. And so I structured the novel over two intertwining timelines. One of them takes place in the East End of Glasgow, just after the Thatcher years, um, where a lot of the working class community had, after having been buckled by the mass unemployment that Thatcher brought to the city, some of the young men were growing up with an air of cynicism to them. They were thinking, what is life about? They didn't see hope or opportunity coming. And then the second timeline takes place a couple of months after that, and that's in the north of Scotland. And it's at the beautiful side of a beautiful loch. Uh, you know, Scotland is a, an enormously stunning country. And young Mungo, as a character, is, as an inner city kid, is taken out into the wilderness in order to make a man out of him. He goes hunting and fishing and camping. This is a good thing for young men to learn, and except it has a dark understory. Well, the thing is, is that we, as readers, are looking at it from a 2020 perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and you set this at a very specific time, at a very specific place. Glasgow in the, in the 1990s. I mean, there's this sort of innocence mm -hmm. about certain things that, 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 that is a very, I mean, it's a very specific world you're building here. Um, can you talk about like the sort of the Glasgow that, you, that you're presenting here? Yeah, I don't even know that it's just Glasgow, but I think we live in a very gendered world, and I think the 90s were even more so. And as the son of a single mother, I, I grew up where my mother thought the best thing for me on any given day was to have male influence or to be around other men. And I think that was true for a lot of boys. And so whether someone was building a garden shed or had got a motorbike or the man up the road was going fishing at the canal, it was just good to be a part of that. But we were also living in a time when society was really naive and we weren't quite sure of where our monsters were in society. We hadn't reckoned with the church. We hadn't reckoned with sports coaches. We hadn't thought about all the ways that children might come into harm. We were living in some kind of ignorance and naivety. And when I was writing this book, I wanted to play those two things together. Because also as a young queer person, as a young kid at six, seven, eight years old, I was very victimized and made to feel like a monster. You know, so society kind of looked at me and said, you can't possibly want to be gay. Why would you want to grow up to be a pervert? You know, and you're like a seven year old kid. And you're like, I don't want to be a pervert. And like, but you know, it's a, it was really how things were organized. And yet we had no idea where the monsters really were in society. And so I take these two timelines to, to counterbalance those things and to have them weave together. Uh, you're talking about, um, you know, sort of how you grew up. And obviously when pe people read Shuggy Bain, uh, when people, uh, read Young Mungo, they'll, you know, they wonder how much of your own life are you mining in order to write these books? I mean, I think you and I talked a little bit before we got out here about the fact that you've grown up in, in a place of addiction mm -hmm. and it's, it's, all, it's the area all around you, not only in your family. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, Glasgow is a beautiful, diverse city. It has a very proud working class, but unemployment under the Thatcher government went to the high 20 percent and it stayed there throughout my entire childhood. And so what that means is there was a lot of good people having a really tough time. And my own family went from a very working class family where everyone had work to a place where we couldn't find enough work some days. And my mother became a single mother through no choice of her own. And she suffered with alcoholism my entire childhood from my earliest memories up until she died one day when I was 16 quite quietly. And so from that place of grief and loss and and just that human struggle is why I wrote Shuggy Bain. That's, you know, so I wouldn't ever look at the book and say some of the events happened to me. That's a wrong way to read it. And certainly Agnes is not my mother and I'm not Shuggy. But I draw on a lot of my own experience to build this world. I was as poor as, as queer as, uh, as touched by addiction as Shuggy is. Young Mungo is a much more fictional book uh, for me. But I was also a young man. A lot of what Mungo goes through is trying to fit in to quite a narrow 
uh, world of masculinity. There was a very tight way that boys were allowed to be. You had to be hard fighting and love football and hard drinking and, and these things. And Mungo's just so far to the outside of it. And part of that draws on my own experience of being really terrified and terrible at performing my masculinity. You know, by the time I turn like 14, 15, 16, I become my number one oppressor because I'm internalizing all those things and I just want to be straight. I just want to be normal because I just want to be invisible, right? I want to be left alone. And so Mungo was trying to fit into that masculinity. So he's running with the local gang. He's doing things that are asked of him. He's consistently throughout the book asked to man up, man up. Even the women in his life want him to be more of a man than he is. And he's, he's up until the last moment, he's probably not capable of it. But, you know, the thing about, you know, all this, the man up is that then he has this, this other person, mm -hmm. James. We can, we can, we'll, we'll get that, but that, that much of a spoiler. He meets this other, um, and James is Catholic, mm -hmm. and, and Mungo is Protestant. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, you know, it's actually something that didn't really occur to me. I mean, whenever I think that of that sort of conflict, I think Ireland, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that that was also in Glasgow as well. Yeah, it's much, much less so. It mm -hmm. never, ever uh, gets to the violence that you would associate with Northern Ireland or the questions of identity in that way. But, you know, when Glasgow was booming, it's on the west coast of Scotland. We're, we're the closest neighbor probably to Northern Ireland. And we had an enormous amount of Irish immigration. My own, my mother's side of the family are from Donegal. So, you know, I come from a Catholic and a Protestant family. But in Glasgow, and only in the East End, and maybe the bit in the South Side, within working class men, it can be very tied to sports teams. Who do you support? Do you support Rangers or Celtic? It can be tied to a very sort of tribal housing estate, boundary definition. And for young men who organize themselves into gangs, like many cities have, it can be a thing of reputation. It can just be a way to identify yourself. It, it becomes quite tribal. And so, it's not really a huge thing, but at the same time, I don't think we couldn't help but feel affected by the things that were going on in the troubles in Northern Ireland. You know, one of the things that always uh, surprises me is Glasgow has the second largest Orange March outside of Belfast. And so we have an Orange Pride March every July, and those are generally for the purpose of antagonizing people. You know, some of it's for Protestant pride, but they do march through Catholic neighborhoods, and so that creates a tension. So has in both books, uh, Glasgow is really in a depression. I mean, has it managed to sort of pull itself out of that? Or yeah, and, and in fact, even in the eighties and nineties, um, you know, it's a diverse city. It has extreme wealth. It has some of the oldest universities in the world. It has some of the most important culture in the United Kingdom. And some people through the Thatcher years prospered. Um, people made an awful lot of money, but not my family and not my community. And I always look to represent the voices from the margin or the people that you never see represented in literature. Even when you look at stories that are set in deindustrializing places, uh, you know, communities going out of work, that's often thought of as a heterosexual male narrative. And so we don't look at mothers, we don't look at queer boys at all. And I just wanted, that's why I wanted to write Shuggy. Like this is a very familiar story. I mean, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia can relate to Shuggy Bain, but we never look at the mother or the, you know, or the, or the queer son. And so Glasgow has absolutely had a renaissance and it didn't fall on its knees even in the 80s, but there were some communities. One of the things that happened with the mass unemployment is it took 11 years off the life expectancy of the men that lived on the housing estates where I grew up. And that's an enormous amount uh, for the fifth richest nation in the world. You know, that's, that's really a crime, I think. And you can see how it sort of shapes the lives of everyone in your book. I mean, this, you know, you, you and I were talking about the fact that, you know, in Shaggy Bane, you, you know, you have, you have Leek who could be so much more if he was able to develop his dreams. And, and so much of it is this idea of who has the luxury of developing their dreams mm -hmm. uh, or following their path. Yeah. Um, and it, it feels like, that's what they keep fighting against in, 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 in both books. Um. Yeah, I think one of the things that unifies the books is that sense of the community around you is all that you know. You know, there is a, I think sometimes it can be a cliche that working class communities or tight knit communities are incredibly warm and collaborative places. And I think they're very inclusive if you can conform 
And one of the things about Agnes is she can't fit in with the women around her. She can't, you know, she has bigger ideas about herself. She has aspirations. And the women around her see her as a single mother that likes to drink too much and is a bit too friendly with men. And the Catholic mothers reject her. And then Shuggy also can't fit in with the boys. And so they're suffering their loneliness in very separate but very similar ways. And I wanted to talk about that, about working class communities, because when you, when all you know is the four of the six streets that you grew up upon, then it's your entire reputation and your entire self-worth and your understanding of yourself. And, and for Mungo in this book too, it becomes paralyzing. It becomes, it becomes very suffocating because his older brother is actually the head of the local Protestant gang. And so he has a very big agenda with reputation and making sure the family are seen to be incredibly tough. And he's drawing Mungo constantly into that. He's, he's trying to keep up the family name, essentially. Yes, and there's so much uh, emphasis on you know, being a man and this and that. And by the way, um, feel free, there, you know, we have Slido. Uh, enter your questions. Uh, we want, we want to hear them. Um, and you know, one of the questions that we have is that, you know, it's true, I mean, Hamish, um, a lot of the men in this, these books, both books are, you know, misogynistic, they're homophobic, they, you know, they, they do horrible things to both um, Shuggy and, and Mungo. But there are, you know, le people like, you know, Leeks and then Agnes's father, they're sort of more empathetic. So what were you trying to do with those characters? You know, I don't think they all are. I think, I think you're right, I think some are. And I think what I'm trying to show is a spectrum of masculinity. I think we oftentimes narrow working class men into only one thing. But you have, even in Shuggy Bane, you have Shug, who really just uses women. And then you have Wally, who's a very upstanding Catholic father, but who does a bad thing, or does a thing that he thinks is right with Lizzie and, and the child. And Eugene's a very good man, and he makes a... I know, it, the, 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 the jury <laughs> is out on Eugene. But he, makes a, but he makes a bad decision, and they are part of a hard-drinking community. So he, he thinks, in a way, he's helping Agnes. Leek, for me, is my Thomas Hardy moment, you know? He's that eternal question of how hard it is for working class men to ascend to a place of academia or learning because we have to worry about today, today, today. And it's a huge privilege to be able to think about your future four years down the line when you've got to keep a roof over your head for your, your mother and your younger brother. And so Leek, for me, is my Jude Folly. But, but yeah, I don't think they are all unified through misogyny. I think because Shuggy has a lot of homophobia that some of the men don't quite know what to do with them. But they're not always cruel to them. They're just a bit confounded by them. One thing that, um, I, you know, I, I would say is that you really, in both books, you really start to care about these people. They, they start to live with you. And, and, and I would say, and I would ask, I, I believe in, in Young Mungo, there is a bit of a cameo, um, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. And so uh, is that true? Well, the readers will have Perhaps. to find out. Yeah, maybe. okay. Uh, it's actually, it's funny because not many people notice it. It's quite a big cameo. Um, so I'm always keen to see if people notice it. But for me, I'm, you know, I'm writing a tapestry. I, Mungo is not a, a sequel to Shuggy, but it's part of a cycle. You could almost imagine them as cousins or as people who could pass each other on the street. You know, they're, they're, their lives are very intertwined in a way on a community level. And perhaps in the future, there'll be lives that I want to pull together um, and see them as adults or something. I'm not sure yet. But, but for me, I, you know, this is the heart of me. This is my community. These are the people that fascinate me. Even as a, as a New Yorker now at 45, my childhood has informed everything about me. It's, it's um, you know, even when I find myself in New York making decisions, I do it with a Glaswegian mentality. I think about life in that way, and I don't think any of us can quite shake our childhoods. But you've had a, the opportunity to explore at least some of those aspects through your books. I mean, so basically, if this is a tapestry, what do you think you would go on to in your, your, your third book? Oh, I, I can't give the magic of that away. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I just published my book on Tuesday. Uh, We're you, relentless. We want yeah, it. You are. You are, Emiko. <laughs> but, um, you know, you, but you said, like, I heard something there where you said, but you have your art, you have your thing. And actually, that's really interesting to me because I think a lot of men are not encouraged to talk about their trauma or their pain or their loss, We're especially from the west coast of Scotland. But I think it's kind of universal, and I think it's especially true of working class men. 
And my art does that for me. It allows me to process an awful lot of things that actually I've never verbalized. And so even to my friends or to my husband or to people in my life, I don't share a lot of my own personal history. And so my art allows me to untangle it. And, and people ask me often if my work is cathartic to me, and it is, but not because I get to share some pain or some trauma, but because as a fiction writer, you have to be very certain of the motivations of your characters. And sitting and thinking, why would a character like Agnes Bain drink when she has three beautiful children at home? I had to come to terms with, why would my own mother do that? You know, And that brought me to terms with thinking, well, my mum left school at 14. She married a man. Uh, she was told to settle for a very traditional life. She saw the city around her fall to bits. Her marriage fell to bits. She didn't see hope coming. And so sitting with, why would somebody do that, was really helpful for me. So I would say in Young Mungo, there's a bit of why would someone do that? And I just, you know, I do want to get to the question, but one thing that is interesting about Momo mm -hmm. uh, is that she is such a young mother. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's very, when you look at the decisions she makes, you have to be reminded that this is a woman who had three kids before she was 20, which is just yeah. mind blowing to me when I, when I figured that out. Yeah, she's, she's a young mother and, you know, she's, the readers will have to read the book, but she's, she's abandoned in, through a tragedy in raising these kids. And she's very different to Agnes Bain because Agnes is a woman, I think, who's coming to terms with her, her fading appeal and her fading options. And Momo is ready to start a new life. Momo is ready to get back to the party. And so, in a way, she becomes... Uh, a, a, almost a tragic comic mother. She's, I actually find her quite funny. I hope readers do too, because she says the most outlandish stuff. And, but she's always forever disappearing. And so Mungo really is being raised by, he's being pulled in this triangle between his older sister, Jody, who is so bright, she's going to become a biologist. She's, she's so capable, but she is so ready to escape her family and her siblings. And her, his older brother, Hamish, who has, is going to really make his name as this gangland leader. And so they both have very different futures for him, but they both need him to conform in the way they want him to. And that's why James, the, the, the other boy that he meets, is so important to him. Because James, in his own way, is a motherless son. And so there are all these young men on the brink of manhood, and no one's looking after them. And they're trying to figure out what's going to come next. And that's part of the reason why they fall in love. So is working through their lives, I mean, is that, is our, does, does that become your psychiatrist then, you know, being able to work through? <laughs> You're going to become my psychiatrist. <laughs> what is your hourly rate? Um, you know, you know, I was really lonely as a young gay man. I came up as a time, you know, first of all, like, I didn't even know I was gay until everybody told me I was gay. At about seven years old, it was people that noticed I was different before. I had any sense of it. I was just a kid. I just liked what I liked, and that wasn't what boys were meant to like. But I came up in a time before email or before the internet or, or before any gay pride had come to anywhere but a capital city. I think it was still four years before there was a very small gay pride march in Scotland. I came of age under the fear of AIDS, and, and there was no positive representation of gay people in the media. And so I felt entirely alone. Nobody in my community would also say, hey, I'm gay because there was such fear of retribution or violence. And, and so in a way, in writing Young Mungo is answering some kind of wish fulfillment for me. Because Mungo does something very simple. He looks out the window, and across the back of the other apartment blocks, he meets another boy. And he just sees them, and they're that close together, and they have a beautiful relationship. But I think that loneliness had always affected me, because it was only when I was about 18 or 19, and I got to college, and I started to have a bit of a network and think, God, I'm really not alone in this. Um, did that change for me? But like. 13, 14, 15, 16, I felt deeply alone. Oh, man. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know. It, it, and, but sort of, okay, well, bringing it to more. You wanted to be my therapist. You gotta, like, <laughs> well, we'll, you're going to we'll, do it, you get the whole job. Well, you know, since, since you are mentioning college, and then we'll, we'll talk about, you had this whole other career. Oh. Um, and you know, uh, you know how to, you know, you were in the fashion industry. Uh, you know, this, you said you study textiles. Mm -hmm. This is a, a whole other life. So... What, were, did you still want to be a writer, or sort of when? How did this sort of come into your life? Yeah, you know, I just grew up in a community that didn't have any books. We and it didn't make us any less creative or curious or 
or compassionate as, as young men, but we just didn't see our future in books. And the literary community in the United Kingdom at the time was incredibly classist. It wasn't engaging working class audiences. It wasn't really traveling much further than London. And so we just cracked on and we got our culture from cinema and from television. And in fact, we did have books at home because my mother was incredibly house proud. We had about six shelves of all these identical red, fake leather bound <laughs> books. But if you like reach, they had all, all these gold writing on them. They were beautiful, they were so beautiful. But if you reach for them, you took them off a shelf and you opened it, they had video cassettes inside them. And so <laughs> you thought you were gonna get like Henry James and you got Dynasty, and, uh, <laughs> which is, is kind of a bit like Henry James. But um, <laughs> it's, you know, so that's, that's what you got. And so we just didn't have it. And so I didn't really read my first book till I was 17. I mean, I could read. Education is excellent in the United Kingdom, but I didn't really enjoy a book until I was 17. And for me then, it was too remedial for me to think of a career in English or academia or, or teaching. And so instead, I was encouraged towards textiles, which is a really proud Scottish trade. It's great for creative kids. It's also a trade-based thing, so you can get a job in a mill if you need to like earn a wage. And that's what blossomed into I became a knitter. My knitting made me a fashion designer. My fashion education brought me to New York. But at the height of my fashion career, when I was, um, when I was a vice president for a design company, I was unhappy. I was uh, like almost achieving everything I needed in fashion. And I thought, I've always just wanted to be a writer. And that's when I sat down to put my first words to Shuggy Bain. And you did, when you were sending this out, you did get a goodly number of rejections, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I mean, so I got rejected. I did what every unknown author does where I tried to get an agent, and I was rejected a lot by agents. But I finally land my dream agent as fate about, took about six months. And she was really confident, and she sent it out. And she said to me when she was sending the manuscript out for submission, if you get rejected, do you want to know? And I thought, yes, because it will make me a better writer. You know, The only opinion I'd had up till then was my husband's. And so I thought, yes, it will make me a better writer. And like in that first week, I got 20 rejections. <laughs> and it was so funny when I won the Booker about a year later, I was sitting there and we were, I was talking to a journalist about rejections. And he said, were you rejected? And I said, yeah, I was rejected really quickly about 20 times. And my agent leaned over and she said, it was 44 times I stopped telling you. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, you could not take it. And I was like, yeah, that's probably true. But then, you know, it gets the, the Booker Prize and then people are referring to it as an instant classic. So... There was nothing instant about it. Yeah. Like, there was, there was 10 years of writing. But that's really kind. I think it's a timeless book. Um, I didn't write to, into a particular zeitgeist or a moment right now. But I think the human condition is eternal in that way. And so, hopefully, it, it, you know... It, well, I'm thinking also, it, both, both Shoggy Bain and, and Mungo, Young Mungo, they speak to marginalized people. I mean, yes, they're about a specific time and place and people, but you, but they can relate. But you can relate. You don't have to necessarily be a young gay boy from Glasgow. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe so. I think many people can relate to Shuggy because they've just felt like outsiders in the place that they live, or they felt like they can't fit in, or they've, or they've tried to change themselves in some way. And everybody can, I think, relate to Agnes. Um, I, think, I think you really can, whether you've ever had an addiction problem or not. Because at the end of the day, Shuggy Bain for me is just a love story. I think people think about some of the darker issues in it, but I only ever use darkness in my fiction to, to like really compress the diamond at the heart of it. And what I wanted to do was, you know, love is no good unless it's tested. Like, what is love? If, if you're just a wonderful person and I just love you, that's lovely. But like, unless someone that you love really is failing or is flawed, then, and your love's not tested, then what is it really worth? And so much of my writing is about that. It's the same in young Mungo as well, I think, because Mungo has a capacity to love people that don't necessarily love him back. Um, and I'm always writing about how we care for one another, but also how we're abandoned by those who should be caring for us. And there's so much love in all of the in both books. There's yeah. it really is. But you know, you talked about the fact that you didn't start reading until you were 17. Um, so what was the most what was the early book that you read that had the most impact on you? Oh, I'm a huge Thomas Hardy fan, but I had amazing English teachers. I, you know, 
I'll tell you a real anecdote, which is really funny, because I think we, the school I went to was really deprived. It was called Crooks and Castle Secondary School. And the community around us did a, a very noble thing where when you turn 16, it was thought, just leave school and go get a job. There's, I have a lot of respect for that. It's very dignified. But I don't think we ever thought the kids from that school would ever go on to any kind of literary success. And in the past five years, I won the Booker Prize and another kid won the Orwell Prize. Uh, a totally different writer. And I think that's really cool um, because, but you know, we just felt like books weren't quite for us. And so I think that sort of feeling on the outside makes you want to rush in and make space for yourself. But um, yeah, the first books that I read were Thomas Hardy and I had an amazing English teacher that just saw I was sort of struggling to keep up and, and he put them in front of me. And when I first read Tess of the D'Urbervilles, although it was set in the 1880s and a place I'd never been, I could see reflected through my own mother's life how women's fate can really be determined by the men in their life and by the reputation that they have within the community that they're in. If I think about Tess and how she's used by Angel Clare and her father and, and all these other things, I could really draw a parallel with Agnes Bain. And the same with Jude Foley and, and Leek Bain. Yes, and actually, the, you, yeah, you look at the women in both books and how the men use and treat them. I mean, the women in your books are so delineated I and mean, they're so specific. I mean, you just, you can't write them off. Yeah, I think if I could have in Shaggy Bain, I would have actually had no men in the book because everyone thinks of industrial places in Glasgow as a whole as a very masculine place. It's dominated by industry, any kind of industry, by sports, by a lot of heavy drinking and so that can make it a very masculine place but I'd known it as a feminine place because my whole world was my single mother who I just orbited but then all my mum's friends and my aunts and the women she would drink with and the women she would fight with and the women she would fall out with and so I almost saw this other side of Glasgow that made me think of its strength as being feminine but I couldn't have a book about economic unrest and exclude men you know, it would have, I would have loved to have been able to do it, but you can't think about minor strikes and you can't think about shipbuilding and, and all of that. So I tried my very hardest to almost push the men to the margins of the page and just to keep your eye on Agnes and Colleen and Jinty and Leanne and Shuggy, you know? Right. Um, you've lived the second half of your life outside of Scotland, but your, li your writing is so specifically set in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you keep your writing connected to the, that city, considering that you spent so much of your life here? Yeah. Well, well, Glasgow's still my home. My family still live on the streets that I write about. Mm -hmm. And so I go home two or three times a year. And I go home any time where I feel like I don't make sense as a person. It, like the time comes and you think, I just gotta go home. Because like, <laughs> you know, you've gotta almost reset in a way. And so I think no matter where you go, your Scottishness, it's not like a coat you can take off or like leave at the door. Even in this room, everyone thinks of me as Scottish, even though I've been an American citizen for 10 years now. And so it's just formed everything about me. And, and I, I think I write, one of the things about living in New York that it's done for me is it's, it's given me distance and perspective. So it's allowed me to see what I want to tell with my stories and, and to reflect on it in a way that I don't know actually if I was still living there, I would feel the need to reflect that deeply. I, what for for what what sort of still do you think what part of you is still so connected there? I mean, what what do you think is still the story of Glasgow you're trying to tell? I think it was just a growing up was just a time of really extreme humanity. There was so much compassion and solidarity because so many people were going through the same thing, but there was so much turmoil, you know. And it's a I don't know if anybody knows a Glaswegian or even um, has been to Glasgow, but it's. People are fascinating. They live life in a very unvarnished way, a very real, very raw way. And they live full emotions. You know, there can be an awful lot of sadness, but with humor, there can be tenderness with violence. And I like that, you know, they don't, they don't uh, curb themselves with politeness. They just get on with living. And that makes for fascinating fiction. Like that's, that's the kind of humanity I like. Well, that, it's interesting because both books have that, it, it, I mean, they have, there's, especially in young monk there's there's a lot of pain yeah. there is definitely a lot of pain and yes at certain points you might want to like you might not be able to take it and you might have to put it down for a sec and just breathe and then pick it up and and but at the same time there's humor and there's love and it's just and the characters 
stay with you. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you and I were talking earlier, and you were talking about the fact that you want to give people the experience, not necessarily, you know, make them happy all the time, just, but really makes them feel an experience, just to be immersed in a world. That's totally it. I think good art's only obligation is to move you, is to make you feel rearranged. And if you're going to give me 16 hours of your time, then I'm going to try and move you the, as best as I can and make you think. And I like to create an immersive world for my readers because I think most readers might never see a working class community or people living with poverty or travel to Glasgow. And so I want them to be able to step in and for Agnes to be their friend and to be someone that they, they, they feel that they, they should care for, the same with Mungo and James. But before I'm a writer, I'm a reader. And for me, the thing I love most in a book is when I close the last page, I want to think, don't go. You know, I, think, I just want to think, don't go, stay with me or tell me what you're going to do next. And that's all I really try to do with my books. I don't know if I succeed, but that's my goal. So has the success and the fame that, that has sort of come from Shuggy, and now you're the you know, Man Booker Prize winner of Shuggy Bain, has that been what you sort of dreamed of when you were first writing the book? Or is there days that you wish you could go back to being the aspiring writer of Shuggy Bain? I think, you, I think the thing about winning a big literary prize is it pushes you up onto the surface of your life because you're always touring or you're talking to people and you can't really write from the surface. You've got to be in some kind of solitude. You've got to be allowed to sit with your art and, and just commune with it deeply. And, and so I'm so grateful for the readers that have come with the prize, but really I'm, I'm keen to get back to my desk and just and to spend time with my characters. You know, Shuggy and Agnes and, and even Mungo and James I was alone with them for five years. And that's where the sweet spot is for me. That's the, that's the part I enjoy, you know? And when I was writing Shuggy Bain, I was working full time and I was working in New York. And fashion's a fascinating industry, but one of the things about it is it has no conclusion. You don't like close your computer at the end of the day and say, I've done my job. Like there's always something to be going on and something you've got to catch and it's always shifting and moving. And so some days I only had like 30 minutes to write and it would be on the train in the morning. There was six weeks I couldn't get to a computer or write in a notebook. But every single day the characters were in my mind and I was talking to them. And when I wasn't talking to someone else, I was just listening to them. And they were telling me things and they were telling, that's why the book was 1800 pages. Because <laughs> perhaps I have my own schizophrenia. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was how I really approached my writing. But did you have a hard time letting them go? Are they still with you? Or yeah, I think Shuggy was done. Um, I think Shuggy was done for a few years before I could say goodbye. Like, I was teaching myself my craft. I was learning how to write for the first part. I was shaping the story. But there was two or three years at the end where I just couldn't say goodbye. And I didn't want to share it with anyone else because I didn't want anyone else to perceive them. They were, they were my friends. They were my people. Um, but you had to because the book, that's why I started Young Mungo before I was published. You know, it went from being this thing that was drawing me through my creative life like a sail to being an anchor where I couldn't move beyond it. It was, it kept tethering me back. And that's when you know you have to let go of something. You have to say goodbye. One thing that I, cause I think about both these books, they address people on such a personal level. I mean, they're just, you know, the, 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 the ideas about masculinity, about great love for someone who has an addiction, you know, the, the family. And I'm thinking that, it must arouse such powerful reactions from readers. And in a way, I mean, you, you put the book out there, but then you get all this response back. And what is that like? It's been really wonderful. I honestly can't complain. It's, I think so many people deal with addiction or with loss or grief or, or some kind of trauma, and we do it in silence, you know? I grew up in a community that if your dad or your brother was drinking too much, he would do it in the street and he'd be fighting. And you'd be like, oh, that's John. That's what John does. But when you have a mother that, that suffers like that, you do it very much in private because, you know, it's society doesn't like to look and people don't like to engage with it. But you're also, any woman in the room knows how precious a reputation is. And so you're always trying to not damage someone's reputation. So you keep very quiet about it. And there's a lot of pain there because actually what you need a lot of time is to be able to share that and to be able to reach out for help. And what Shuggy has done for me is allowed me to get help in that way. But it's allowed a lot of readers to come forward and say, actually, I grew up in Wisconsin and I was Shuggy and I loved Agnes. And, and, and I think, you know, a lot of people say that they've never had anyone else they've been able to tell that to. 
I don't know if it's true, but they, they write me lovely letters. Sometimes, I mean, do you ever think that you would want to write a memoir? I'm just curious. Never. Ah. I think there's a couple of things. I think psychologically I never felt worth it. And so I think there's, I think there's a self-worth thing that poverty does that we're not quite sure. Ah, yeah, that we're not quite sure if your story is worth it. Now, that's wrong. Um, but I think that's a, a thing that I am wrangling with still to this day. Like, is my, would my own personal life be worth it? But also, I didn't want, you know, one of the things that Glaswegians do is we reject pity. We're not interested in pity. And a memoir, I think, if I'd have written myself as Shuggy and centered everything happened to him, it would have been too narrow of a perspective. And I didn't want it to be visited on pity on the boy at the center. The things that Agnes go through, that Eugene go through, that Leek go through, all of these, Lizzie and Wally, are just much, you know, there's, everybody has a story. Everybody has something that they're, they're struggling with, their conditions that they're trying to overcome. And I didn't want everything to be focused on one single character. Shuggy, actually, you, you spoke about quite an intimate book, but I'm always trying to work with a cinematic and then the intimate. I'm always playing with scale. Also in Young Mungo, I like to come out and look at the city and the landscape, and then I like to come in really close and look at just a mother and son in bed or two young boys having their first hug. And, and that, for me, is important because perhaps if I'd grown up middle class, then my family would have been the only family on the street who was having a tough time and everyone else would have been getting on with their things. But it wasn't true. You know, I was a family that was having a tough time surrounded by other families that were also having a tough time. And that's why the characters of the Annie or Leanne are important to me, because I don't want you to be like, oh, poor Shuggy. I want you to be like, well, actually, this is happening everywhere. Yes, Leanne is really, she doesn't appear for a lot of it, but, but, she ha but her appearances are just so heartbreaking. Um, and her mom. Um, we have a question here, you know, what do you think it says about the publishing industry that you were rejected so many times and yet you end up winning the booker? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a gamble always, I think, is the, is the first thing. And, and you know, an editor should reject a book. Rejection's a really necessary part of a writer's life because readers will also reject your book. People will, you know, it won't be for them. No thing can be for everybody. And rejection is something that Shuggy still goes through. You know, he's been rejected by international publishers. And, and, and you want an editor and you want a publishing house that will really believe in your work and your voice and be your champions during tough times. And there is no tougher time than publishing your debut novel and a week later having every bookstore close because of a pandemic. Yes. And so that's the definition of a tough time. Like that's, I don't think anyone saw that coming and Shuggy vanished. I mean, Shuggy was, uh, was, a dead, was dead in the water, to be really honest. And my publishers never abandoned my side. And, and so that's why rejection's important, because you want that relationship. You want someone who who will stay with you. Yes, that's what I couldn't believe. It was like February 2020, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it, that was when it was published. Yeah. Um, but we had a book launch, and everyone's like kissing and hugging, and we're, <laughs> woo, we're having a great time. And then it was the last time we saw anyone for two years. Like, last time I saw my friends, saw my editor, all of it. It's so funny because... And that they saw anybody, yeah. Someone is just asking the question that suddenly popped into my head when you said cinematic, mm. which is, um, have, so is there a possibility for, for Shuggy or to become a, a film of some sort or a screen or, a, you know, a, a yeah. series or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope so. I'm working right now with A24 Pictures and I'm writing the scripts myself. Um, I signed up for it a, a year or two ago, and now I'm like spending more time with Shuggy and Agnes, and I'm a bit like, that was dumb. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that'll be about 14, 15 years. But, but we're hopeful. We don't know if it will come to screens. We don't have uh, a streaming service yet. But it will be an eight, if it does, it will be about eight episodes, limited series. And I, I wanted to do it for several reasons. First, because it's a very personal project to me. And I wanted also to show different facets of the characters. I didn't want a literal translation of the book because I want to hear more from Leek and a little bit more from Agnes and from Wally and Lizzie. There were characters in the book that I love deeply that I didn't get to give enough page time to. But also, as a young man, as I said, television was my, was my church, was, my, was, you know, was everything that I got for culture. And there will be people that you know, in my community at home that still will feel that way, that might never read the book, but will love the story and will get it from television. And so I felt like I owed that to, to my community. 
Excellent. <laughs> that, that's good to know. Keep your fingers crossed. Yes, because I could, you, you can actually almost see the images there. Yeah. Um, do you... I, I think because I'm a visual thinker, actually, the words are the struggle for me. It's all the textiles. It's all the textiles. Um, but I've always been thinking visually and just interpreting the world that way. And so I can almost see a chapter. I, one of the things I do as a writer is I don't often begin a chapter not knowing where it's going. And so I can see it almost as a movie and I think about it and I walk through the angles of it for a couple of weeks and then I sit down and I begin to write it. And so it's that leap from the movie that's playing behind my eyes to, to the page that's the, the gap, but, but I carry it with me as images for a long time. Did you know where both books were going when you started as well? Yeah, I knew where Shuggy was going to start and where it was going to end and what would happen to the main characters. I just didn't know all the finer details. But when I began writing Shuggy Bain, I was so intimidated by the idea that I was trying to write a book because it was too big of a thing, right? And who was I to write a book? And so all I did was I just wrote a sentence and then a paragraph. And, and any time I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to write a book, I would think, oh, calm down. Like, like, that's a lot. That's really intimidating. And I think in culture, we're always like thinking about the end goal and it flavors the thing we're doing. And it's better sometimes just to commit to the journey and see where it goes. And so I actually wrote chapter 13 first. My very first line is the two brothers on the slag heap, right in the heart of the book, because I could see it like a movie. And I could see Leek turn to Shuggy. Leek gets his rejection or his acceptance to art school and he turns to Shuggy and tries to make him walk like a man. And then I wrote chapter 22 and then chapter three. But the book came together in that way, almost like scenes. But Mungo came together from page one to page 350 because I knew what it, I had a plot. So you, you mentioned Thomas Hardy, mm -hmm. um, but what I mean, were there other novelists who influenced you? Yeah, I tried to take everything from every book that I read and I think there's merit to everything. And I, I love Cormac McCarthy. Um, I love his sense of place and his sweep. I love Toni Morrison. Um, I think that's where I try to borrow a lot of my intimacy and a lot of my sort of tenderness from. Um, and also, Toni is quite a violent writer. Um, it, I don't think she gets enough credit for that. And so that tenderness and violence together is something, you know, that I think she's a master of. And then from Scotland, I'm a huge fan of Alexander Trockey and Alan Warner, who wrote Marvin Caller. Agnes Owens is my favorite Scottish writer. Um, because she writes about sons who are s suffering and doing very masculine things, but she writes about it with the tenderness of a mother. Okay, so everyone has been writing those authors <laughs> down. I don't right? think you can get Agnes Owens. She's, uh, she's out of print, but if you ever come across it in a secondhand store, I will, I will reimburse you if you don't like it. Uh, so are, uh, are you know, so those uh, any other contemporary novels that you're interested in or...? Yeah, I mean, loads. That question, when people ask that question, the first thing that happens is every name flies out. Of your yeah, head. I, 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 like I'm you're sure. just like, what did I read last week? Um, I, yeah, there's loads. I love a Scottish writer called Jenny Fagan, who writes a lot about um, feminism and misogyny, but through the time. She writes very dark Gothic tales. She just wrote one that was called Luckenbooth, if you ever get to read it. And she's written one now called Hex, which is about the Gellis Duncan uh, witch trials much like Salem, uh, also happened in, in Edinburgh. Um, I love Bernadine Evaristo. Um, I think she's phenomenal. Damon Galga, sorry to name the Booker winners, but um, I've been really sort of loving their, their catalogue. And I think you also mentioned a, a memoir by, uh, by a woman who ended up being a, a writer for The Guardian. Uh, oh, this is actually before uh, yeah. we came out here. So. God, you're listening very closely. Yeah, actually, because I was thinking a lot about um, how naive we were about uh, sexual abuse and about predatory behavior back in the 80s and the 90s. And I read the most remarkable memoir by a woman called Deborah Orr. She passed away a couple of years ago, but she was the head of the Guardian newspaper. And in it, uh, you know, she's a 16 year old girl and she's walking home and she's assaulted. And she goes home to her family and she says to her mother and her mother says to her, that didn't happen. That didn't happen to you. And she writes this book around this. Well, it did happen, but almost like society couldn't face that this had happened to her. They didn't want to know, even her own family. And, but the memoir's called Motherwell, which is a play on words because it's also a town and it's a critique of her own mother. But um, it's, I love that memoir. Yes, and the, the, this, this idea of you know, writing at a particular time. But um, this, uh, another question from the audience, um, and I'm Glaswegian? 
Glaswegian. Glaswegian, thank yeah. you. I knew I, I knew I was gonna have trouble with that. <laughs> the, the sort of the slang that you use in the book, it, it's wonderful. It's really, and also it's also in Mongo. It's very flavorful. It gives you a sense of place. But how is it? How big a trade-off is it for you to have that sort of local flavor and yet still be accessible for you know someone in Pittsburgh to pick it up? And, and still know what's going on. So how much do you sort of sneak in and keep or keep out? Like, yeah. okay, that's too much. I was just in Philly and they asked me if I wanted water rice. So, you know, <laughs> everywhere's, got, everywhere's got their regional accent, I think. And um, for me, I couldn't imagine writing a book about Glasgow without using the language because I think it's one of the most remarkable mm -hmm. things. It's frequently surprising, it's delightful. It can be really violent when it's really tender. It can be funny when it's threatening. Um, you know, we're a, we're a culture that has six meanings for the C word. You know, it can be a real term of affection. It can be a term of threat. Uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very funny language. But one of the big decisions I had to make when I was writing Shuggy Bain is, Agnes and Shuggy are characters that don't turn to literature or find themselves in literature. And so was I going to write in, in, in received pronunciation or, or in Oxford English? And was I going to exclude the characters that were at the heart of this book or wasn't I? And it wasn't a hard decision for me because I would want Agnes, if she was real, to be able to open that book and to laugh, you know, and to be able to enjoy it. And, and I think readers are curious people. That's why we read. And I think if you hear a different accent or you hear a different use of words, you can Google it. But, but like anything, it's like a song. As soon as you feel the rhythm of it, you know the chorus and, and you can pick up on the, on the cadence. And I think that's the beauty of writing. So you get sort of carried along by the language. Yeah, Cause it, it makes it immersive. One of the things that was hard, sorry to cut you off, but one of the things that was hard was I had to rewrite a lot of Shuggy Bain because I was being too fancy. Mm -hmm. When I was doing the first couple of drafts, I was using these really long words that, that they wouldn't do. And I keep thinking about the line in Shuggy Bain that says, uh, you know, Shuggy looked at the light and it was the daylight was the color of two milky tea. And that took me a really long time to come up with because it was all kinds of other things that would have shot over his head that would have meant the author was in the room, but the character wasn't. And I thought, if he looks at that light creeping into the room, what color is it to him? And, and I had to go through all that book and really, you know, place myself with the characters. Mm -hmm. So another question from the audience. You're the youngest of three siblings. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, three siblings in both books. Mm -hmm. um, what do they <laughs> what do they make of your success um and like what is your dynamic maybe as opposed to the dynamic that we see in both of those books <laughs> yeah um yeah i like triangles i'm actually the baby of the family but actually my most fascinating characters are always the middle child i love the middle kid because i think they're very put upon they're always trying to hold together very extremes in the family they're the most interesting characters for me my family are super proud of me they were proud of me anyway but I told this, I actually did an interview on the BBC with the Duchess of Cornwall, the future Queen of England. And, and she said to me, what did your family say when you won the Booker? And I said, oh, it's funny. Like I phoned my big sister and I said, sis, sis, I've won the Booker. And my sister went, oh, that's great. Do you know I tried to return a top to Primark today and I forgot the receipt. <laughs> and, and there was this hideous moment where the Duchess of Cornwall sort of goes like this to me. And then she, and then she went, ha ha, she started laughing. And she said, families have a wonderful way of keeping us grounded. <laughs> and I thought, there you go. And so that's true. I think, you know, my family are very proud of me, but it, I actually am quite proud of the fact that the book doesn't mean much to them. Mm -hmm. but they, they never, like, say, wait a minute, did you use that part? You, they, they, they all understand the whole fiction concept. They understand the fiction. And my siblings are so much older than me that by the time I was growing up, I was more or less home alone. Um, I mean, my, my sister's 15 years older than me. And, and the thing is, is when a mother has three kids, she has three different kids. But when you're that far apart in age, you have three different mm. mothers. Um, and so, you know, we just intersected with this woman at different stages in her life. And one of the really revealing things was, is I was bullied for being gay from about the age of six on. And I was, society was telling me that there was nowhere to turn with this. You know, I wasn't seeing it on telly. Uh, you know, even people that were good people still use quite bigoted language. You know, they, they would have thought it was funny or it was insensitive, but they weren't doing it in a hateful way. And so I just didn't think I could tell anybody and I didn't tell my family. And I'd forgotten I hadn't told my family that I was bullied for about eight years at school. And when they read Shuggy Bain, my sister turns to me and she says, were you bullied like that? And I went, oh yeah. 
And I was so fearful as a kid that if I went home and I said to my family, you know, I'm being bullied for being gay, they're all saying, you know, I won't use the words, but they're saying I'm this and this because I like to do this and this and I like dolls and that. I was so worried my family would say, well, well, are you? And then they would also reject me. Now, of course, they never would have. But you can't tell that to a kid that's surrounded by hate and who's internalizing self-hate, right? And so they just think, oh, God, the problem is mine because everybody's in on this. And so that was really hard. And so that was a good thing that came out of Shaggy Bane. Right. Um, <laughs> one more audience question. You're going to be sorry you asked that. Well, <laughs> you know, just sort of um, other than writing, is there another profession you would like to do? I mean, you've, you've already done, uh, you've already done. Who asked that? Uh, <laughs> how many jobs do you want me to have? <laughs> well, let's see, I mean, you've already had a couple threes. Yeah. So you might as well add a fourth, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't actually. I'm, I'm a person that uh, when I'm working, I really focus. And so I sometimes lack in hobbies, I would say. Um, so no, I mean, I would like to get back into visual arts in a way I just can't maybe work there full time and write. And I'm so happy to be writing full time. Um, but maybe I could do a small thing. I'd like to always get better at knitting. Or you could maybe do a graphic novel? Sort of incorporate the visual images with the work? Some, someone asked me to, if I wanted to write a children's book and I thought, have you read my fiction? <laughs> I was like, that'd be the quickest banned book in the history of America. Like, it would be banned before publication. Oh, but I would say that you, you definitely have things to say to children too. Thank you. Um, and especially because, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit, about the fact that both Shuggy and Mongo, they're, they're perceived as threats because they're different. And that is the, this is a, such a terrible thing for a child. Yeah. But or it was a, a young man. Yeah, it was a universal thing. I think people keep narrowing in on Glasgow as that. But I got to tell you, I don't think it was great to be a young gay person in the 80s about anywhere um, in the world, honestly. And readers are reflecting that back to me. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a hard thing when you're in a community and the community doesn't know what to do with you. Is that one of the things you'd like people to sort of carry away with them? Or is there anything in particular you want people to carry away from either of these books or both? I think just the characters. I mean, it's the best thing in the world when someone like feels like a character was real. The biggest compliment I get is when I go back to Glasgow and people say, oh, I knew Eugene, or I know a Eugene, or I, I know that. And they can think of Jenny McClinchy as a person and oh, she's a terror, you know, she's an absolute terror, that woman. And I'm like, she's not real, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but like everybody knows Jenny McClinchy. <laughs> and, um, and that's what I like. That's, that's why you do it, right? That connection, that, that suspension of reality. That moment of joy. A moment of joy. And don't go. And that connection and that don't go, yeah, that's what I love as a reader. That's, that's, that's as simple as it is for me. And bring them back when you write your third book. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe, fingers crossed. But. You're like my agent, you're like. <laughs> <laughs> and, but they, but there is, they, they speak to you. Um, mm -hmm. they, they speak to me and, 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 yeah. and I have to, and it is, that, that is one little caveat I would say about Young Mungo is that it does get to you. So every once in a while, feel free to take a break and come back. Yeah. Actually, it's funny that you say speaking to you because one of the things that's happening with the screen translation is I can see the page and I can see what Agnes says. But when you give Agnes a chance to say something else, she like says something totally different. And I'm like, Agnes, you can't say that. That's not what you said <laughs> in the book. And she's like, but I want to say this now because, because you've put me on the other side of the room because it looks better. And I'm like, Agnes, you can. And so they're always speaking. They're always changing. And that part of that's just changing the medium. When you change the medium, the characters have to rise to that. But it's also because to me, they just feel like they've got more to say. Yes, and you didn't, you didn't cover that part in the book. And so they need, they need to be, yeah. they need to flesh it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, they, they, they will, so hopefully we'll be looking for that series very, very soon. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we can all write to A24 if they take, the, take a while to, to get <laughs> that going. <laughs> Petition. But um, I think, yeah, it's about the time that we should be wrapping up. Yes. Um, but it's been so lovely, and, and yes, it is, both books are just s such beautiful reads, and I thank you so much for both of them. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. I haven't been in Boston in ages, so it's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Thank you for coming. Uh, check out our website, wbur.org slash events for our spring lineup. It's quite full. Monday night, we're kicking off a series on phenomenal women with Tiziana Deering interviewing Katie Ray. Douglas will be out in the lobby signing many books, I have a feeling. <laughs> that was really wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.